Everybody, welcome to the Gym Masters Show Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. It's so great to have all of you here. Thanks for all the love and support and uh, praising of our incredible series where we're celebrating incredible people who are doing great things. And I tell you, we've got an amazing guest who's joining us here from New York. The incomparable May Pang is joining us. And if you are aware of that much talked about extraordinary documentary, The Lost Weekend, then you know what I'm talking about. If you are not privy to this, you're going to learn so much in the time that we have with our extraordinary guests. I had an opportunity actually to uh, chat with and meet May at a Mutual Friends concert event a few years back in New York City. And I have to tell you, May is nothing more than fun and pleasant and approachable and warm and loving and affable. So if you've always heard about May Pang and you've always wondered, you know, is she like that? She absolutely is. She's a terrific person. And this particular project that we're talking about, The Lost Weekend, is extraordinary. This has been a labor of love for her for many, many, many years. And uh, she's open, she's real, she's authentic, and she tells the story, which is quite riveting. Uh, it's quite beautiful. It's quite emotional, all at the same time about the time spent, of course, with the one and only John Lennon. And it's a very, very moving and touching story. And you have an opportunity really to learn about the time they spent together, but also working together professionally and all the other players and other celebrities, other people that were involved as well. But also it sets the record straight. You know, for so many years, you have people that say this and say that, and oftentimes it's not accurate. So when you have the person who lived the experience themselves telling the story themselves, it's always the best. And that's the case with The Lost Weekend. Let me tell you just a little bit about this extraordinary documentary that you must, must see. It's also available on Blu-ray as well. It's John Lennon and May Pang sharing this wonderful time, a weekend that lasted actually 18 months. And it's a love story that took 50 years to tell. Right, 50 years where May felt comfortable enough to get it all down, to get it all you know, ready to go for everybody to enjoy and uh, revel in. And that's exactly what she did. And it's one of those kinds of documentaries that once you watch it, you want to watch it again, you want to watch it again, you want to share it with people. The Lost Weekend, a love story, explores this 18-month relationship from 1973 up to 75 that John Lennon spent with May Pang his Chinese-American assistant turned lover on Yoko Ono's insistence. That's right, you might not have known that. And with May's help, John Lennon reunited with his son Julian as well, which I thought was really a beautiful part of the story. And he had his most artistically and commercially productive period post-Beatles as well with the albums Mind Games and Walls and Bridges. He wrote a song for May as well. And this included his only number one hit single, Whatever Gets You Through the Night, was rock and roll. And he also collaborated with Elton John, David Bowie, Harry Nielsen, Mick Jagger, Ringo, just to name a few. And uh, May Pang chronicles all of this, revisiting her younger self, her 22-year-old self, experiencing her first unforgettable true love. And for nearly 50 years, you know, she's read and heard many authors and experts and friends and acquaintances recount her life, few of them who really were actually there. And for the most part, she says, the recollections are skewed at best. The story has become part of a myth created, you know, by Yoko and John for public consumption. A lot of people think the time with John, known as Lennon's Lost Weekend, was literally just a crazy weekend in Los Angeles. Others know John and she were officially together. And that was for a year and a half. And they made a life together and loved each other uh, deeply. If you realize the relationship, uh, you know, lasted. And uh, who knows if it would have even had continued beyond. We'll find that out. But really, it's, it's this, an extraordinary story of love. And these photos, we thank May Peng, May Peng Archives for these beautiful photos. She is a spectacular, you know, uh, photographer herself. She's also very big in animal rights and also makes wonderful jewelry as well. So we're going to be talking about all of those wonderful things in the brief period that we have here to really celebrate this extraordinary experience with an extraordinary person who's lived an amazing life and continues to. 
Why don't you welcome with me our very, very special guest from New York, May Penn. May, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you back with us here to see you again. Thanks for joining us, my friend. My pleasure. God, it, I can't believe how long it's been. <laughs> I know. Too long, right? Yeah. We've got to pour wine and break bread and catch up, but we can do some of that now. And I just want to personally say, May, thanks for doing this. Thanks for um, really sharing in such a warm and open way your life. It's not always an easy thing to do, but you've done it in such an eloquent, moving, and emotional way. Congratulations on this documentary. I know it's been a multi-year love affair project for you, and uh, you wanted it to be just right. You took the time, and we thank you for that. Thank you. I mean, yes, it took a long time. In fact, I wasn't. People ask me why I didn't do it sooner. Um, I wasn't ready. I didn't think it was necessary, really. I said I didn't care so much. But I think uh, as time went on, when you start hearing your stories being told by other people and and the way they wanted it done, and they, I love when they come up to you and they say, "I know everything about you." There's nothing I don't know about you. I said, right. oh, okay. really? Right. All right. And, you know, there's nothing more right. you can say to someone. Yeah. Were they... you there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know. Were you sitting under my bed? I, I don't know about. <laughs> um, you know, and they and they try to tell me the answers. I know what you were thinking. Oh, okay. So after a while, it just got to me. And then I said, you know, I'm going to take it back. I'm taking my, my, my life back from other people. And that's really... Um, the way it happened. And um, it was all on the spur of the moment. And, you know, what people don't understand, this didn't take a day, a, a week, or months. It took more than, you know, six years to really finally get it to where, you know, from the time I said yes to doing it to the time it was, it had come to the screen. It's more than six years. That's a long time. And what was that process like putting it all together? And how did you know how you wanted it to, to be presented and absorbed by the public at large? You know, I, I sat down with um, the three uh, producer, co-producer directors, Eve Branstein, Richard Kaufman, and Stuart Samuels. And I told them how I felt my, and what I wanted out of it. And they asked me a specific question. And I said, but I'm not going to be the one to doing it. But I want you to know, you know, this is what I wanted. They honored that. I stayed away from uh, their creative process because I they don't need somebody meddling in and say, you know, I don't like the way I look there. Can we change it? So, you know, I I, I basically um, gave them the 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 time to do all of this. Of course, if I didn't like something, they would have really heard. But really, nothing. They really, um, except maybe an exchange of photo that wasn't correct a person. Right, right. Um, they they did an amazing job. Richard Kaufman just took because uh, he was the one who did most the understanding of the uh, filming and the photography and and the shooting of this whole thing. So and everybody and everybody came to together and we all worked very very hard for this. They did I wholeheartedly recommend people check this out and just, you know, block out the evening or whatever it is, your own weekend and just watch it and savor it and enjoy it. You grew up, of course, in New York City in uh, Harlem, right? It was a Spanish Harlem where you grew up? Yes. Yes. I and know people would not think so, but then they hear my New York accent. and Yes. Well, somebody else that did as well, and you may, I'm sure you've crossed paths, who was actually a dear family friend who we of uh, course, lost only about a year or so ago was Ronnie Spector. Yes. Yeah. And yes. Ronnie didn't live later on. She didn't live far from me. She actually lived uh, around the corner uh, from where I was living. And um, um, I still can't believe that Ronnie's not here. I mean, it's no, like no. Known for years and it's, yeah. I've seen it through the tumultuous times with Phil Spector. Which you can yeah. attest to. I yeah. can attest to firsthand. And right up to, you know, you know, to when she remarried and, and everything. And I, you know, it's 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 very sad. What a great talent. What a great singer she was. A lot of great talent, as we know, have come out of that area. Tell us about those early years growing up. And uh, your mother 
a wonderful influence on you as well because she was quite successful with her own business too, right? Well, you know, she she knew how to make things work for her and for the family, really. You know, she comes out of China, you know, with an arranged marriage to my father. She, you know, she had no idea. And she looked at this man and she goes, oh, my God. Um, and she was left in China to deal with a lot of stuff. And that her there? Was, uh, yes, that is my mother there. She is so beautiful. And you see you in her so much. Oh, thank you. I got my father's height and my mother's looks or a combination of the two of them. You know, it's like my mother was the strongest one. She, um, you know, she came from an area of China where the, 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 where the Japanese invaded the area. And a lot of people didn't realize that. And that's, and she had to, uh, when they came in, they were, they were, um, you know, pillaging the village, as it were, and she was freaked out. She would, she was running through the rice paddy fields on days to away from the Japanese during World War II. She had, um, so I'm even more um, I admired her because it affected her even in her later life. You know, she she would be, you know, when she would sleep, she was always um, saying things in her sleep, and I I would wake her up because she was in tears. And she then told me as I when I was finally able to comprehend, she said, "Oh, it must be when I was running away from the Japanese when I was in China, you know, when they raided the village." And I was like, "Oh my God!" Mm. So, you know, I look at her, and she still forged on. So she's a big influence, and she always used to say, "You know how to speak English. You're in this country. You go do what you need to do." And that's exactly what you did. You actually approached uh, what was it, a record company? Was it Abco? And so it was Abco. Yeah, then here we what are. A great training ground. I mean, yes. Alan Klein had just acquired Apple Records, and and their uh, three of the the major founders, of course, was Ringo, George, and John, and 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 running the company. But mind you, he also was managing the Rolling Stones at the time, and he had he had one of the best publishings, uh, um, music publishing companies. I mean, he had um, Cameo Parkway, which, you know, all the Philadelphia stuff, um, CAG's Music, which was Sam Cooke, and then he had the Rolling Stones, you know, the, the immediate uh, music and all that. So, and then now we add Apple to the, to, the, um, to the mix. And so it was just a whole lot of good music and I was thrilled. And didn't you get offered the opportunity to work in the area of royalties and copyright as well? Music publishing, they, that was one of the first places they put me in. I was thrilled to know that I could see who wrote the songs, some of my favorite songs. You know, you, you're, you're looking at Cameo Park where, you know, the question mark and the Mysterians, a lot of people didn't realize the guy actually changed his name to question mark. Um, and then, uh, and then you have the Rolling Stones, you know, Satisfaction. And, uh, you know, some of my favorite uh, uh, songs that are in there, you know, their early times. And then there's Sam Cooke. Who doesn't love Sam Cooke? You know, all those great songs. And then you have the, this group, this other group, and this guy named George Harrison with the song Something. Or, yes. or John Lennon with, with the Instant Karma. Or, you know, and then... And then you have uh, Ringo, you know, so you have all these other. And then there was Apple Publishing, which took in all the artists that was on Apple. So Badfinger was on there as well. Oh, yeah. Now, even before having the opportunity to come across and meet and work with John and, and Yoko, had you been a Beatles fan already? Did you appreciate and enjoy their music? Oh, I love their music. I, I still have my my original album when I was 13 years old. Do you I really? Thought, yeah, this, my vinyls, I'm not giving them up. They're sitting in my my uh, my little cubby hole there, yeah. <laughs> so for our viewers, and again, we don't want to give too much away because it, it, it's something that you must spend time, you know, lock the door, let the dog outside and just get some popcorn and really soak up this incredible documentary. Um, the the meeting the bringing together you with John Lennon and Yoko Ono how did that happen and what was that like? It was um, you know when they entered the office in this is in 1970 in December of 70 and uh, I remember them coming in and seeing them and I went oh my God what are they doing in town 
Uh, I've soon found out because I got a call from the office manager and he said, uh, John and Yoko are in town. They're here to make a couple of films. They need people and you're it. You're one of them. And I had no idea I got chosen to do it. And, uh, and that's what started the, the whole thing working with them because uh, it, I guess they, they liked the way I worked or whatever because they continued to keep calling on me for, for different projects and things. And I ended up going to London um, and working over there for a short time as well and then coming back and then working for them full time. Again. Absolutely. Um, somebody that I think you had an opportunity to meet too while in London was the incomparable photographer David Bailey, right? Oh my God! Yes, uh, I mean, who in, would have thought? Blow I mean, up was about him, yeah, uh, yeah, that movie Blow yes. Up. I was so thrilled because I had started. People don't realize I like taking photos. I was doing that like since I was sixteen. You're incredible with it too. You really capture the essence. Uh, yeah. Thanks. I just like people, and I like, and I saw things that that. You know, I like to interpret. I'm looking at them. I said, oh, I like to get this moment. So knowing, you know, understanding about photography a little bit, just trying to pick it up um, on my own. But I saw the movie. I thought, what an amazing photographer seeing his work. And then, of course, there I am with, with Yoko, who's having a – they said, oh, no, you're, you're coming. She has a photo shoot. And I said, oh, okay. And not knowing. And then they said, oh, yeah, the photographer's David Bailey. I mean, I was just like – Oh my God, I was beside myself. And then to actually act to be in the photo, because he asked if I, he said, I want you in that photo. It was John and myself and Yoko. And there I am. And I'm saying, I'm, I'm being photographed by David Bailey. That's all I kept thinking about. It was, it's quite an experience, right? <laughs> Absolutely. When you see your idol on uh, and photography, you know, there it is, that photographer, there's that guy from Blow Up. And I saw the movie when, you know, when it came out, you know, who would have thought I was going to meet him? Absolutely right. And then the time spent in England, do you come back to New York or do you guys then head for some time in Los Angeles? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not. I'm still working. You're for them. still doing it. I'm yeah. still working. I'm, this is only 1971. Right. So we come back. I'm still working. The thing that happened with me and John didn't happen until 1973 right. after I moved them into the Dakota. Right. And didn't Yoko, you know, the two of them weren't necessarily, things were happening in a beautiful way. Things were going awry. Yeah. And Yoko had approached you and she thought that John needed to be with somebody. And she actually approached you. And, and you, in the beginning, were like, thanks, but no thanks. Appreciate it, but I'm not going to get involved, not interested. Uh, but she really was hoping that you you would, huh? Yeah, she really hoped I would, and I said no, and I kept saying no. And what the what changed the tide was as time went on, all of, you know things settled down, and as I hoped it had settled down, nothing was going on. Um, was all of a sudden, John himself was started to chase me, and I'm like looking at him like I'm not interested. Stop it! And he wouldn't stop, and, and in a sense, he he kept pursuing me. Until finally I said, all right, let me, let me see what's going on here. And yes. I went out and, uh, and he had no idea. It was Yoko was like, you know, they weren't getting along. And then I didn't want to be thrown in the middle. I said, I'm, I don't want to be in this middle. And he said, I know. And I don't want you to be there. And I don't know what it is, but you know, I want to, I want to see where we are too. Mm -hmm. I like to take you out. And I, I'm going, what is going on? So it, it was still a, one of those, I'm, I'm walking on tender hooks the whole time, you know? Yeah. Oh, I can imagine. Yes. I mean, here, you know, somebody that is uh, expressing this interest, was it, was it odd in a way? Because even though they weren't getting along, Yoko was still, you know, part of the scene. That must have been, we, we were in an uncomfortable place. I, I was. I mean, yeah. I didn't want to be there. and But in the beginning, I wasn't part of it, you know, because she kept pushing and I said no. And I, I just sort of blocked her out for that, you know, that part of it. Um, but when John pursued me, then it became a little weird for me, even, from, you know, like I, I said, I can't do this. And um, that's when John suggested, it was actually John who suggested that we go to L.A. She had no idea. She was out of town. Mm. And she was the one. Uh, she was going away for some conference or something. And John turned around and said, 
we got to be, we got to take time for ourselves. And so he says, we're going to Los Angeles. And we left with um, his lawyer who was leaving that night. He says, we're going, we're going to LA with you. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> that was it, right? Yeah. Now, uh, while you were out there, you had an opportunity to come across um, some extraordinary people too, right? That you uh, you met. Well, there were a number of people out there. LA is a, a little tricky place. I mean, everybody seems to gather out there. I mean, we had. Uh, I saw a number of people from Harry Nielsen to Ringo to Phil Spector to. Uh, of course. Um, and then there was, you know, at that moment in time when seeing all these people and Mick Jagger and everybody, um, John said, you know what? We just came off of uh, making mind games. Why don't we do an album of oldies? I don't want to produce. We'll just get, he said, let's get Phil, Phil to do it because he's out here. It's an oldies album. Let's just go and do this. Um, you know, he was just ready after mind games to go and do the, like a rock and roll album. Well, he said, are you sure you're going to let me handle it? He goes, yeah. He goes, I just want to be a singer. I just want to do some of my favorite songs. And somehow I was getting a little nervous because, you know, every night when we would rehearse, uh, you know, Phil would come over and carried his guns. And I kept thinking, can't be, the, can't be the real thing. John and I kept saying, can't be real guns. No one's going to let him carry the with bullets. Come on. Right. Mm. Well, we were wrong. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, when he shot it off in the studio a, month, a few months later, um, typical New York girl, yeah. I run towards the sound. Everybody else is ducking. Yes, <laughs> right. Going, right. Yeah. And I run, I'm going, what is going What's on? What's happening? And yeah, I go into the, the, uh, to the booth where the, the room and there's John with his finger in his ear going, shoot, shoot me, Phil, but don't mess with me ears. You know, I need them, you know, because he's thinking it, it went off and it whizzed by him, you know, up, up to the ceiling or whatever the sound was. And Mal Evans, I said, Mal, who was the original roadie for the Beatles, and was like a teddy bear, six mm -hmm. foot four or so. And, oh, yeah. And he goes, what's going on? He says. I'm like to know what's going on. You know, it, it's, he says, oh, Phil, we were just horsing around. And I just told Phil not to do, like to jump on me because it was like, it was hurting my nose. And, um, and I, hold on. And I, <laughs> and I just, God. Um, You're so popular, Bay Pang. I'm You're popular. popular. <laughs> uh, and it turns out that, uh, you know, it was uh, a bit crazy. So he says, I told him not to do it. And then Phil just backed up and pulled out his gun and said, you can't tell me what to do. And, and it went off. Mm. So the next day, so when everybody calmed down, we went back to work. The next day we're eating dinner and Mal comes running towards me. And yeah. um, I said, John, what's Mal doing in the restaurant? We were having dinner. Yeah. And he goes, oh, I'm glad I found you guys. And he goes, well, what is it? And he goes, well, here's the bullet from last night. Yeah. <laughs> and John and I went, yeah. bullet? Yeah. What bullet? And we realized he's been wandering around with a real bullet in those in those guns. Uh, yeah, unbelievable. You had an it opportunity is. to, of course, uh, know Tony King as well, right? Who introduced oh, you to Elton John and, and so many others. Well, he was working for Apple at the time. Yeah. And he happened to be on holiday right. in L.A. at the same time we were there. So it was a good thing. So we said, all right, you're here. We're going to utilize you as well. Wow. well. Help us out. And, you know, and so before going back to, to, to England, yeah, we could work and, and, and be a working vacation, as it were. So we could, you know, Apple can pay for part of your stuff while you're Thanks. here working with us. Right. So he stayed and and um, and he says, oh, let me introduce you to my to my friend. And he goes, oh, you'll love him. It's Elton. So we met on on my birthday, actually. It was, um, it was when we were doing, uh, he was uh, doing the Mind Games video. And, of course, he's dressed as the queen, you know. And, and Elton came in that day. And, you know, and, and there's Tony King all, you know, all dolled up as the queen. It was just a, a laugh. It was such a good day. You know, uh, it's been said that some of the most productive and incredible years that John has experienced were during the times that you were on the scene, right? Yes. Yeah. 
and in fact, when uh, if you what was it since uh, seventy or seventy three to the to early seventy five, and the the amount of work that was done was really done in that time period that he's been known for. So from the from the mind games that we started, right through jam sessions with Paul and and yeah. Linda and and we did one with um, uh, what was it uh, Mick Jagger. Uh, we've he produced Harry Nielsen. We did Walls and Bridges. We went out and um, did a song for for Ringo and went out there to to help him with it. And uh, you know, and then we did rock and roll. We finished that off. You know, you, there was a, a slew of work. He gave songs away to to uh, Keith Moon and to Johnny Winters during that time period as well, which is incredible. And he wrote and David it. Bowie and Elton John. I totally forgot those too. Yes, absolutely. And also, he wrote you a song too, yes. which uh, was quite special, right? In Walls and Bridges, surprise, surprise, Sweet Bird of Paradox. Yes. After the first night that we got together, he came up with that song. Uh, and what was that like? I mean, here he's writing this beautiful song for you as well. That must have been an extraordinary, and folks can hear it on this uh, this album. That must have been really something extra special too, huh? I was, I was, I, I didn't, I'm speechless. I didn't yeah. know what to, I was just so taken aback. And I'm thinking, did he just write a song for me? Yeah. I mean, I, it was so, that was so uh, something that I, I didn't expect. So it was, um, it took me a while to let it sink in. One of the beautiful things too, uh, before we get ready to wrap, um, is you were sort of instrumental in, in getting John and Julian to sort of reconnect and even bringing in uh, Julian's mother as well, which I thought was so beautiful for you to do, May. Well, you know what? John needed to get together with his son. He hadn't seen him in three or four years and he was calling and he needed to see his father and he hadn't seen him. And um, it was time. And yeah. it, and I told him it would be easy. I would make the transition for him to see him, make it very easy. And he uh, agreed. And uh, with Cynthia, it was great because I wanted him to talk to her. He hadn't talked to her since they had parted. And so I gave them time to have their closure, yeah. which they never got before. You know, when you look at it all, as we get ready to wrap, um, it, it was an extraordinary time in your life. And did you, what are some of the things that you were left with? We don't want to give everything away because we encourage folks to, you know, check out the documentary. But he really was a funny, witty, loving man, wasn't he, John Lennon? Ah, uh, he, uh, he didn't take himself seriously. Right. Believe me. He, uh, he didn't think he was... There's a great a part of him when it, that there was a, an announcement on the on the TV set saying the legendary Eric Clapton, and he went, "Oh my God!" And I said, "What?" He goes, "Oh, I couldn't live up to that." I said, "Live up to what?" He goes, "Yeah, to be saying I'm legendary," and I'm looking at him going, "Okay." He didn't take him. He didn't think that he was quote legendary. No, he really was somebody who just lived life, and you had an opportunity to have an extraordinary time with him. Uh, personal assistant, production assistant, work on some extraordinary music, and uh, you both fell in love. Do you think that perhaps um, if the moons were lined up a different way, it may have continued? Oh, I think people need to see the film to know the rest of the story. That will sort of give that sort of insight, right? Yeah. You know, you're amazing, May. And to again, as I mentioned, to be so warm and so open about it, it's authenticity on your sleeve. It's really extraordinary. And we encourage folks to, to check it out. You can get it on Blu-ray and so much more. And it was at the Tribeca Film Festival too, right? Yes, and it was one of the most requested movies. <laughs> yeah, yikes. <laughs> it actually May broke the internet the first 10 minutes it aired. Really? Yeah. They had to ask us to, the producers, to can they expand the bandwidth because it was too many people trying to get on. Well, we want to thank you so much because I know you got to scoot off, but I just want to personally thank you for taking the time not only to come on the Gym Master Show and express, um, you know, your openness and your love for John and appreciation for his talent, 
Well, we also express that to you because you're an extraordinarily talented person yourself. As I mentioned, you're very big with animal rights. You also create jewelry. You know, you're still doing photography, uh, which I witnessed when we were at the concert in New York. Um, you're still connected and plugged in and you're in a sweet spot in your life right now, aren't you, May? Well, I hope so. <laughs> anyway, no, I, you have to take every day as it comes. You know, life is short and you got to enjoy it. And that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm finally doing everything that I wanted to do that I've held back. My kids have grown. I'm ready to keep moving. And you are. May, thanks so much for joining us on the Gym Masters Show. Uh, thank series. you, Jim. It really was an honor and a pleasure. And we thank uh, Andrew and the team and everybody. And uh, let's hopefully get together in the city soon. I would absolutely love that. Okay. You know where to find me. We know where to find you. Okay. Thank you, May. Congratulations on everything. Love you and you take care. You too. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye now. The incredible and comparable May Pang here on the Gym Masters Show. We thank everybody. Uh, who worked with us to make this possible. This was really an extraordinary conversation. And here is, again, we don't want to give it all away. We just gave you some snippets. So that way there, you can really check out this amazing documentary, which again, I would say is worth every second of your time. Again, The Lost Weekend, A Love Story explores the 18th month relationship that John Lennon spent with May Pang which was extraordinary. And what was really interesting about this conversation that we had, and in the documentary you'll see as well, Yoko Ono actually encouraged the relationship that John Lennon and May Peng had. And that is something quite interesting. And as May said, it was not exactly something she you know, pursued. It wasn't something that she thought of. It wasn't something that she specifically said I was gonna embark on. It just happened and they truly fell in love. It was a real love story. You know, it's called The Lost Weekend, but it was an 18 month relationship. She was also on the scene, May, while some of the most incredible music that John penned was created. And we talked about some of that as well. And as you can hear, her phone was buzzing. You know, she's she's uh, got a lot going on in her world. But we appreciate these wonderful photos from the May Pang archives as well. If you ever get a chance, if she does a showing, which she's done, she did one in the springtime at City Winery. If you uh, ever get a chance to go to a May Pang photography showing, I encourage you to go. Uh, she is a brilliant photographer as well. But these are some phenomenal shots. There they are with Paul Newman as well. And the other thing, too, that was, again, we don't want to give too much away, but the fact that um, she was instrumental in bringing John Lennon and Julian Lennon sort of together with John, with uh, Julian's mother, uh, was, a, was a really beautiful thing for May to actually have done. And the fact that she actually took the time to do that just really speaks volumes about, uh, about May. You know, as I mentioned, they she had an opportunity, to, of course, to meet Alton John and Harry Nielsen and, and a lot of other folks. Really uh, incredible Alice Cooper as well. And phenomenal story about working with uh, Phil Spector, of course. And that was just really the short version of the story. Um, and the other thing, too, we've talked about some of these other amazing albums that were one of the things that I love, too is May actually was on the vocals, which I think is fantastic. Uh, if you are aware of that, you know, as a super Lennon fan and uh, May Pang fan as well, that uh, she provided vocals, which I thought was really, really cool. And again, she grew up in New York in, uh, you know, Spanish Harlem, and she sort of made her way starting out in the royalties publishing area, copyright area for the music industry, and then came across John Lennon and Joko, uh, Yoko Ono, and the rest really is history. Uh, it really is. It's musical history. It's American history. Um, it, it's <laughs> it's in the annals of, uh, of music history, and uh, I encourage you again, check out this documentary. It really is terrific. It's called The Lost Weekend. There it is on the screen for you, folks. 
a love story. And uh, it is narrated by Yoko throughout the entire thing. And uh, the director's statement says that John Lennon's Lost Weekend has been branded as a reckless low point in Lennon's post Beatles life. The prevailing story for the last 50 years is that in 1973, Yoko Ono sent John to Los Angeles with May Pang, where, you know, it was an incredible situation that went on. And um, it was much more than just an antidote to John Lennon's life. It was something that was really rich in his life, as it was in May's as well. And it was something that, um, you know, is part of John Lennon's legacy, the time spent with May. And uh, May Pang, you know, came from very modest means. And it was a life-changing, deeply emotional experience. And when you watch the documentary, gang, that's what you're going to get. It, it's, it's very emotional. And it sort of brings you, it's a love story. Of course, it's about the music. It's about the ups and downs of life. And um, May Pang witnessed the human side of John Lennon, becoming his compassionate companion, creative associate, protector, and lover as well. And what felt, you know, May had become a footnote in the dom dominant narrative and sort of reflected how women's stories are often buried in history, I realized that there was a context for women's experiences in the early 1970s where young women didn't have the voice they have today. And many finally wanted to set the record straight. Uh, Eve Branstein was first, you know, she first approached May Pang 25 years ago to make this film about her life with John Lennon. And May didn't feel, as she mentioned during this conversation on the Jim Master Show, she didn't feel it was quite the right time. But the two became friends, and five years ago, May was ready to open up her life in a way she had never done before. And the filmmakers believed that women would, you know, identify with a hardworking girl who had been manipulated, felt deeply in love, and then was left behind. But Eve reached out to Richard Kaufman, who then reached out to Stuart Samuels. They decided to co-direct the documentary and formed a creative partnership collaborating with their complementary skills and mutual appreciation of John Lennon and May Pang's love story. According to May, that weekend, the lost weekend, which of course was 18 months, wasn't a momentary fling. It was 18 months of living and loving together in Los Angeles and New York. And far from being a wild, irresponsible time, May says it was a period of productivity, awakening, and passion as well. And it truly, truly was. And the the love, again, that they had, you know, who knows what it have endured today. You'll find out when you watch the documentary, some of that is uh, sort of given you as you watch it. You know, during that time together, as I mentioned, John produced three solo albums. He jammed with Paul McCartney, collaborated with Elton John, produced an album for Harry Nielsen. He wrote music for Ringo, co-wrote for David Bowie's single Fame, recorded his only solo number one hit, Whatever Gets You Through the Night, performed at his last public appearance with Elton John in Madison Square Garden, Thanksgiving of 1974, which is incredible. And um, there was a period of change for John, too. Very private, deeply poignant time for May. And in these different photos and Polaroids that May and John took of each other, you can see the exclusive, intimate, private life. Everybody is inspired by it, too, uh, by the drawings and the doodles that John did for May. And of special importance was uh, to highlight the caring and empathetic May, who actually helped John reunite, as I mentioned, his son, Julian, to restore his friendships with his brothers, George and Paul and Ringo, as well as inspire John to be his most prolific solo artist post Beatles. It's really extraordinary. And the Lost Week in a Love Story shares the facts that were discovered, as well as the heart and heartbreak that took 50 years to tell. And you got a little sample of it here on the Jim Masters show series. What an extraordinary conversation. Again, we didn't we don't want to give it all away. So that's why we had May on to sort of pepper a little of the information for you. Again, we thank May Pang and her archives for these beautiful beautiful photos. 
he came to us from New York. Uh, if you want to check out, again, The Lost Weekend, it is available on Blu-ray. And I have mine, and we saw it and absolutely loved it and actually watched it several times. Watch it again, of course, in preparation for our conversation here exclusively on the Jim Masters show, but also watched it just because I really, you know, when you watch something, sometimes the first time there's the shock value, right? And then you have moments where when you watch something again, it's just like going into an art gallery. You see a painting on the wall or you see a sculpture and you see it and it sort of, you know, alerts you or brings you in. But then when you walk around and you reapproach it and you look at it again, it's like listening to a piece of music. You hear other nuances, see other things that you might have missed the first time you watched or heard or, you know, had an opportunity to partake in whatever that art is. And that's what happens when you watch The Lost Weekend. You know, you're, you're like, oh, wow, this is amazing. This is incredible. And then you sort of fall in to it. Uh, you're, you're along for the ride, which is something very special. Uh, as I mentioned, there's John Lennon fans. There's Beatles fans that love this. There's folks who know May Peng and her work. As I mentioned, May and I met each other a few years back at a concert event in New York, mutual friend. And I said, May, oh, I would love to have you come on the show and you know, chat with us. Tell us about what it was like putting this extraordinary documentary together with Eve and, and every Richard and Stuart, you know, the team behind the actual documentary. And they did a beautiful, beautiful job uh, in putting it together and really lovingly and touchingly and accurately telling the story. There they are in 1974 in Disney World, um, telling or in Disney, telling the story. Um, in a way that makes you feel like you're a part of the story um, just because you're a fly on the wall and you are um, soaking it all up. And of course you're curious about it, but in, in its own beautiful way, it tells the story and it leaves you with a lot. It sort of, you know, plugs in those missing elements, those missing puzzle pieces. If you've always wondered about the story, who is May Pang? How did May Pang get involved with John Lennon? What did Yoko Ono feel about that? Did they ever see each other again? Actually, May Pang did see Yoko um, years later in Iceland. I believe they were staying in the same hotel, and you know they ended up saying you know hello and cordial and and all as well, and um, and that was great to hear, and that was in Iceland, but. Um, to find out more, if you want to know, you know, would they have stayed together? Some of the other nuances that occurred, the extraordinary people that they met along the way, um, the music that was made together. And you know what May did as personal assistant, production assistant, you know, she was very professional in terms of um, making sure that the train stayed on the track and that everything was taken care of and everything was was done. Because, uh, again, this is the post-Beatles era. So she was sort of dotting the I's, crossing the T's, and making sure for John that the things were being taken care of behind the scenes that needed to be taken care of so that music could be made, so people could still appreciate John Lennon's voice and his music. And um, it really is quite something so from you know a young lady with dreams and aspirations growing up in spanish harlem in new york city then approaching you know the record company going into abco and then making her way up the ranks uh, former music executive herself as i mentioned john lennon's former personal assistant as well as production assistant and um they were creatives they were lovers they were in love and uh, it's it's quite the story. And, uh, you know, I can go on about it. I don't want to give too much away because, again, uh, it is something that, um, you know, for those of you, and I know a lot of our viewers love, love stories anyway, you're going to enjoy this. Um, and you, maybe you've already seen it, so you, you know what I'm talking about. If you've seen the documentary, 
uh, let us know. Post a comment underneath this episode of the Jim Masters Show on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. If you didn't see it, when you do see The Lost Weekend, come back to our YouTube channel to this episode and leave a comment on you know, this episode, interact with us and let us know what you thought of the documentary, how open and authentic it is and how real it is and how connecting it is as well. Um, and how it sort of fills in the blanks, you know, there's, this is 50 years in the making. So there's a lot of blanks, missing pieces. And a lot of people, as May said, that she wanted to set the record straight because, you know, there's a lot of stories and somebody tells a story. And then as the story is passed on, yeah, the story sort of morphs into something else. And then all of a sudden you get stories that aren't even reality anymore. It's not the real story. It's not the real deal or it's twisted or it's sensationalized, which, you know, often happens. So in that respect, um, this story is told in a way and narrated by the person who lived it. May Pang herself. Doesn't get any better than that, right? She is a part of uh, musical history herself, and uh, she's humble about it, and that's why it took her so many years to get the gumption to want to set this record straight and to tell the story. Again, she ended up in a situation and in a scene that she could never have scripted or predicted. Um... Her mother, of course, a wonderful source of inspiration. But two, she mentions John was funny and he was loving and he was creative and he could be goofy as well and uh, playful. So this really was something very, very special. We wanted to put this together uh, to celebrate this loving relationship that May Pang and John Lennon had. May, of course, you know, still has love for John, misses John deeply. I know that. And when that announcement was made all across the globe that John had been taken away from the world, um, everybody, the whole world was you know, devastated by that. Gone too soon. There he is, of course, with Julian. And she talked about Ringo as well and these fantastic albums. You know, I know many of you probably have these in your collection already. And I know what happens, you know, when you watch things like this, like this episode of our show, you're going to now pull these out of your vault and start playing them again. And one thing we didn't get to as well was the UFO story where John actually in New York said that he saw a UFO and May Pang was the only one there. And she tells that in this, and I don't again, want to give too much away, but that was really something incredible. And yeah, so it's cool stuff, isn't it gang? It really is cool stuff. And, and, you know, thanks for all the comments. Thanks for all of your interactivity you know, posting comments in our JMS Levity Hall chat room as well. Don't forget to definitely post it um, on our YouTube channel underneath this episode um, if you enjoyed this conversation we had with uh, May Pang joining us from New York, from New York City, back home where it all began. We thank May Pang for joining us here on the Gym Masters Show Live Series. Extraordinary conversation. Just a little teaser there for you. Former music executive, John Lennon's personal assistant, John Lennon's production assistant, uh, as well as um, wonderful love affair for 18 months together, as told in The Lost Weekend, a love story. A story that has been lost for a long time and found again and shared in this documentary. If you enjoyed this episode, folks, we encourage you to do something special. Give it a like, share it, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. It doesn't cost anything to do that. And leave a comment for us as well. Drop a comment. We would absolutely love that. That means the world to us. And we'll bring you more content. You know, we've done in just three and a half time, three and a half years time, over 1,000 episodes of our extraordinary series with guests that come in from 
television and film, music, Broadway, Hollywood, sports, comedy, stage, inspiration, life. And um, there's so many more guests, there's so many more surprises coming up. So, hmm, you know, uh, you can tell that I'm very moved by this episode because I think it was really, really special for me to, she's very busy for her to take time to join us here in her busy life, to want to come on the Gym Master Show Live and open up and, and share her story with us without giving it all away, but share her story with us uh, was amazing. Yeah, you're going to love it. You'll dig in even deeper when you watch uh, The Lost Weekend, A Love Story. All right, gang, I am your host, Jim Masters. Thank you so much for your time. This time till next time, we will be back. Just want to show you that we, got a, we do have a, before we go, we do have a couple of clips here that were sent to us by the team. And we can show these to you as well. And it'll give you just a little more about this documentary. Take a look at this. This is in reference to uh, Julian, John, May, and Julian. John decided we should move in together. We ended up finding the perfect apartment. Can you imagine? I was 23. And my first living boyfriend was John Lennon. We took the bedroom and we fixed up the guest room for Julian. It was an absolute joy and a pleasure. It was just Dad and May, and it was just a happy, happy time. Especially in some of the photographs, uh, you can see that May took of us, of Dad and I together. Really amazing. Here's another clip for you. I seem to be the guy in New York that all the Englishmen say hi to, you know. Oh, which is good, you know, it's mixed in town, Paul's in town, anybody comes, I love it, you know. Paul McCartney used to say, you know, come over to our house and, and Ringo and George and Elton. Funny bit, we were trying to get in touch with Paul and Linda for dinner. We didn't reach them, we left them a message, and as we're coming up uh, 61st Street in the cab, we look over in the other cab and it's Paul and Linda. And all of a sudden we yell out, and the two Beatles, Right? John and Paul stick their heads out and they're screaming at one another, say, I'll talk to you later. And as the car's moving, they split. And it's wild to see that. Incredible. Just some snippets that were supplied to us by the uh, team. And uh, we thank them for that. And again, um, mm, it's very rich, folks. It's very rich. You're going to enjoy it. It is, again, The Lost Weekend, A Love Story. It is uh, available on Blu-ray, uh, so you can go online, you can get it, you can enjoy it and have a good time with it and learn a lot too. It'll answer a lot of questions for you as well. One more time, thank you to the incomparable May Pang for joining us here and thank you for joining us on the Jim Masters Show Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. If you enjoyed this conversational style, bringing back the lower start of conversation as we do, check out, binge watch some of the other amazing episodes that we have for you that are archived on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. And um, come back and see us again soon. We always promise a good time. We always learn something. We're inspired, we're entertained, great interactivity and great, fabulous special guests and celebrity friends stopping by to encourage, entertain, and celebrate life with us here on the Gym Masters Show. For all of us here, I am Jim Masters. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you on the next one. Be well, take care, love one another, take care of one another, spread the JMS levity, and we'll see you again soon. Be well. Cheers. <laughs>